Hi. Down. I think the world of her. I, I had the pleasure of presenting her uh, at Tribeca Performing Arts Center when she won the Monk competition and have subsequently presented her at DC Jazz Fest. And, you know, she she's someone who is really all about the music. I'll give you a classic example. Uh, I went to Monterey the year that she was uh, part of the Monterey Jazz Festival All-Stars, and she was performing in several different contexts at that festival. And uh, then it turned out like a couple of days after Monterey, I had to be in Boston for, uh, for Billy Pierce retirement concert, because I wrote the program notes for that. And uh, I went over to see Danilo Perez, and Marco Pignataro at the Berkeley Global Institute. And uh, we were sitting in their office talking, and I'm hearing this wonderful saxophone playing uh, out, of my, out of my left ear uh, from one of the practice rooms right next door. And I, uh, when we left, I walk out, walk out, and there it is, there she is in the practice room practicing. You know, it's, I mean, she was playing that night for the Bill Pierce program, but and she she played all weekend at Monterey, but still here she was diligently working on her horn. She's very serious, and she comes from a family of saxophonists. You know, her father and her grandfather. You know, ironically, her she won the Monk competition, but ironically, her father. Uh, was a finalist in the Monk competition in the year that Joshua Redman won the tenor saxophone competition. So she comes by it honestly. <laughs> Thank you. 
although you are currently a resident of New York City, you escaped and went someplace else recently. Where is that? Yeah, I'm in Portland, Maine. Portland, Portland Maine. Maine. How is it there? You like it? It's really nice, you know, like I'm, I'm close to the ocean, which is something that I really love. Um, in a big place, you know, where I can practice without the police coming and my neighbors freaking out. So it definitely helps for the mood right now during these hard times. So the police come and get you when you practice? Where does that happen? I think I think it's just like one neighbor that is like kind of freaked out. Um, I used to practice like all day there. I can really go for six to eight hours. And but I got my own practice room. But you know, like after everyone is there, and after a couple of months, I play one note, and then the next the cops come. Um, so you know that at the end of the day, kind of end, ended up stressing me out. So it's nice to have a place where I can just practice without worrying about that. Absolutely, practicing is essential. Let's go back uh, before we talk about your current music and what's been happening lately. You yep. are uh, from Santiago, Chile. You come from a family of musicians. How did you get into jazz? Was it just listening to your grandfather and your father's music? No, well, I started playing when I was six, um, and I grew up seeing my father, you know, having private lessons at home. So when I was around six, my dad was doing like a group lesson and then he had one more person to play like a few notes and I was always around asking if I could take the saxophone. So he gave me my grandfather alto. Um, and I should say my grandfather was a saxophone player, but I he died when I was around five years old. So um, my dad showed me how to play a few notes and I completely fell in love with the instrument, you know, and I play alto for six years and then I heard Sonny Rollins and that was it. I changed to tenor. Wow. Sonny Rollins. Uh, let's look at a little Sonny Rollins and we'll talk about that. Yeah. yeah. What the hell's going on here with my c cursor here? Oh, boy. Oh, boy, oh, boy.
So you're a young woman in Santiago, Chile. You start playing music. You hear Sonny Rollins. What is it about Sonny that captured you? Uh, well, the sound, you know, and, and his humor. I feel like his playing has so much humor. It feels so spontaneous. It's so organic that, you know, from from all the people that I have transcribed and studied, like Sonny's the one that always can just like it changed my mood, you know, it's just I feel very connected to the way that he thinks and the way that he expresses himself and well, the sound, the sound itself. Yeah, he's a, a rather unique individual. Now, when you, when you come under the spell of a Sonny Rollins, did you transcribe his music? What did you do to learn from him? Well, I transcribe everything possible. You know, I read about his history, um, you know, early Sonny, mid Sonny, late Sonny. And I spent a good, like, three to four years just focusing on, on one person. You know, like, that's usually part of my process. Um, I had transcribed a lot of a lot of musicians and done a lot of homework with that. But, but there's, like, three specific saxophone players that I really check out for a long time. Um, Sonny was the first one and then Don Bias and then Mark Tanner. So with Sonny, basically, you know, like I, my process for transcription is not, um, I memorize everything. I believe that when you memorize things, like they stay with you on a much deeper level. Um, I never wrote them down. Um, you know, like also there is a thing where I've been playing for years, so I have an understanding of, of, of harmony and what is going on, you know. But I never really focus on transcribing his leaks or, or you know, or trying to specifically copy, I just like absorb information one after another one, you know, and and I use a program called Transcribe, you know, because I think that when you transcribe, the main point is not really the notes, it's about the sound and, and trying to get into how the person is expressing himself, you know, so really getting deeper into the details. And, and you can't achieve that just with one solo or two solos, it's like really years of really focusing on one person to understand and trying to get into that person's mind, you know. Um, so that is basically what I did with him. I just transcribed everything, everything available, like all the bootlegs, you know, live in Denmark, they went, he played four for like 20 minutes and, and just a lot of listening over and over and over, just one person, you know, until I could understand the sound and how he thinks, you know? Yeah. Well, a lot of people, of course, know about Sonny Rollins, but you mentioned two other sax players that I, I think we should, uh, Get, send out some love for. The first, let's look at a little example and then we'll talk about his playing Don Bias. Yeah, that was from a rare uh, documentary about Don Bias that was done by Norwegian television. Uh, Don Bias spent most of his life in Europe. He came back in 1970, played with the Thad Jones, Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, and what, that's the clip that we just saw. Melissa, what did what would, what did you what do you like about Don Bias? Well, I think that his concepts of harmony is so advanced for the period, you know, where he was playing. Um, you know, it's just like. To me, it's like also like I learn a lot about inflections, you know, which is something that I really use a lot when I play. And there's a lot of players that use that, but like Don Bias, it really feels like he's the master of like, you know, like really getting into a note and those kind of details. Um, I'm so in love with his sound. Um, and there is one specific recording that was the first one that got me. And, and I was introduced to him by, by one of my teachers, Greg Osby, who was one of the, you know, one of the greatest teachers I had when I was at Berkeley. And... And it's this tune called Back Home in Indiana, where he played with Slam Stewart, and it's just a duo tune. And just his harmonic concept back then, like, I was like, wow, I, this is amazing. 
by the time, you know, it's just so hip. And I think that like a lot of, you know, like as a saxophone player, I feel like we, we do have the duty to, to know the history of the instrument, you know, like as a tenor, like I need to check out, you know, Coleman Hawkins, Schubert, um, Lester Young, you know, the list goes going, uh, keeps going, Gene Amos. And it feels like a lot of these old players, what they play is just so hip. And I hear so many modern players I love playing the same thing. It's just the context is older, you know, the sound or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, from all of those people, like Don Bias is the one that always resonated the most to me, you know, just how he played ballads and, and the details. So that is what I actually really got from him, sense of harmony and details. Let's look at a little bit of a more contemporary sax player that Melissa likes, Mark Turner. Thank you. 
You know, one of the things that really makes jazz unique on the tenor saxophone or any other instrument is how individual a musician's sound and approach can be. And I think Mark Turner is a good example of that. What do you like about Mark Turner? Well, uh, well, I can, you know, like I can. One thing is that, like, uh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Uh, so, first of all, like you know, like as I started studying Mark Turner, which I I went through basically the same process I did with Sonny. Um, I did years and years and years of transcriptions. Um, everything available, possible, early, late Martiner, you know. So when you start, like, you know, like the, the thing that, is the, um, that gets my attention the most is the process that they go through, you know, and how they evolve as a musician, you know. That is a very important thing for me so okay, I can understand why they are who they are right now, you know. So with Martiner, you know, of course, it's a lot of, um, I hear a lot of Warren March, which is not the novice um, saxophone player, for a generation to transcribe, you know, and and but at the same time, you can hear the whole history of the instrument. The things I love the most about him, well, is his use of altissimo. I think that like we all very, very feel, yeah. I mean, it's just amazing the way that he achieved playing like that. You know, it's like he really, it really feels like he he brought that part of the horn as another, just as another octave, you know, not as a, something different, and uh, and extended that into like high D or or even higher. Uh, so that is the one thing that I love about him, is just the use of the whole the whole range of the instrument. And then he's patient, you know, like I just feel that he's so patient when it comes to music. He just really takes the time to get an idea and develop it and works a lot with, you know, voice leading and harmonic things. And, and that is something that I love and I connect so much with, you know, just the patient when it comes to music, to really develop a statement, you know, whatever, they, whatever it takes, you know. Let me uh, bring in some audience questions here uh, mm -hmm. from Liam Ilian. Question for Melissa. Tips for getting the most out of music school. I'm going to Berkeley this fall. M Melissa went there as well. What do you think about the best way to learn in a music school like Berkeley? Well, I hate to say this, <laughs> but I didn't learn how to play at Berkeley. You know, like I, I think that is to, the best way to make the most out of the school is really on you. You know, it doesn't matter if you go to Berkeley or Julia or, or you know, if you study with Charlie Parker or whatever. Like the one that is going to make the difference is you. You know, it's just you need talent and then a lot of discipline and and continuity and you know commitment to the instrument and understanding that it's a long process it's a life process you know it's a life commitment so you know in my case when i was at berkeley i think that really did the best out of it because i was able to to get closer to the musicians that i wanted to be around with you know like there were so many musicians that kicked my ass over and over and i was just trying to play with them and hang out around people that play on a much higher level than me so I could become better, you know, and I could be inspired and I could get my ass kicked, which I think that is very important, you know, up to these days. It's important to feel uncomfortable. That is the way that you grow up, you grow as a musician. And then, you know, I had, I had some really great teachers, you know, like, I mean, my main teacher who is like a father to me is um, George Garçon. He was my main teacher for those uh, three years. I was lucky enough to study with another one, Hal Crook, uh, who doesn't teach at Berkeley anymore, but he was one of the greatest teachers I had, you know, Joe Lovano. But, you know, like the teacher is not really going to, it will make a difference, you know, but I think that you, it's your curiosity, curiosity, you know, like you wanted to learn something new and surrounding yourself by that energy and also, you know, going to the teacher and asking like, why, 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 how did you practice? What was your process? And I think that, you know, the most important thing when you take lessons, you know, you're not really going to learn anything new when it comes to, okay, you have to do your thirds and then you have to practice this. And we all know what you have to practice, you know. But it's basically about, like, how you practice it and what is the people's process in order to achieve something, you know. So I think that with that mentality, just trying to surround yourself with the best people as possible and be curious, you know. Don't just believe what the teacher tells you. Like, go beyond that and talk about the process and the things that are important to you, you know. So I think that it's all on you. It's not on the school, it's all on you. One of our viewers uh, who identifies himself as Jazz Fan One asks, is she a fan of my favorite, Wayne Shorter? 
of course, you know, Wayne is an inspiration for all of us. And of course, I have checked out Wayne so much. I did the, my transcriptions and, and I'm deeply in love with him as a musician, as an artist, as a person. And he's just not one of the strongest, strongest influence. But Wayne is, is, is part of who am I, you know, part of who we all are, any musicians, I think. Well, I think he's part of our, our listeners as well, certainly. Uh, yeah. One of the, our viewers, Open Song, asks, when exploring musicians in, sub depth, in such depth, can you comment yeah. how you utilize those influences in your own playing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, like, this is, this is my process. Like, I usually, I'm not really good when it comes to writing down and then taking what, I mean, I did that when I was, you know, when I was very young. When I transcribed Charlie Park, I took the two five and then playing the twelve keys. So that is part of the process. But you know, as I, as I grow older, you know, when I choose to transcribe somebody, it's because I'm choosing something that's going to impact deeply the way I think and the way I play. You know, so I always break down my process in in very simple baby steps. You know, and then the final goal is obviously to try and to be myself, you know, the final goal is to find what do I have to say with all those influence and how those can be, become part of who am I as a musician, you know. But uh, the first part of the process is just like, okay, fall in love with somebody, like that is it. Because if, if I want to transcribe on a, such a deep level, it needs to be something that is very meaningful to me, you know, and it's, it needs to be a purpose, you know, like I don't like to practice for practicing. That is kind of something that never sit well with me. And when I transcribe, I transcribe something because I want some information out of it, you know. Uh, the other thing that is very important, I think, is commitment. So if I start transcribing something, it's my duty to finish it, you know. And that's kind of the way that I approach everything that I practice. If I practice something, I'm going to start super slow and finish it until it's, I can master it. Um, so that's the other thing that is very important, you know. I just stay with one person because I feel like if I really want to get into somebody's head, I need to just focus on that. Uh, second, why, why am I transcribing? Where well, I want to learn about concepts, you know, like not necessarily about the notes, but about the concepts, which I'm talking about sound. You know, there's so many different ways to practice sound, but to me, the two best ways is one, to listen and transcribe the sound, and then you do your own homework with that idea in mind, with that concept in mind that, okay, that is where I want to go, you know. And that's why it's good to transcribe, I think, because it gives you a sense of what you like as a musician. Um, so, you know, I focus a good three years on transcribing one after another one, and I memorize everything, you know, and I play slow like thousands of times until I can just play it perfectly, you know. I usually like the first few solos are hard because you're kind of learning somebody's language, but then after a couple solos, you're, I kind of understand, I'm like, oh, you know, it's not that he's playing the same thing over and over, but I kind of understand, I have a sense of direction, you know. And then in order to get the sound, I think that it's just like one solo, other solo, like hundreds of solos, and, and really focusing on the details, you know, meaning like how he's playing each note, you know. It's not about the note, it's like how he's playing each note, like the vibratos, the articulation, um, the intention, the emotion behind it, you know. And, and these days, so many programs where you can just like take one phrase and play like super slow and, and then really get that information, you know, that is the most valuable, I think. And it's not something that you can learn at any school. And then the, the first baby goal is to just sound like that person, you know. I'm like, I'm going to go to a gig and just trying to sound like Sonny. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. Sonny's amazing and, and that's my goal. And once I feel like I achieved that, you know, not playing exactly like him, but like once I feel like, I got it. I understand. You know, I can't write in a piece of paper. I can't tell you, but I, I understand. It's like part of my of my heart. It's part of my body. That is a very important point because you need to let it go. You know, and that process is as hard as absorbing all the information. You know, because you you get used to think like a person. That person. You know, like everything I'm here is like sunny. Uh, and I want to sound like Sonny, you know, so it's kind of like cutting a part of your heart, a part of who you are, and kind of trying to go completely in a, in a different direction, you know, and that can mean like either transcribing somebody else or or just getting into something different, you know, so... Sorry. So, um, so that is another, like, a good year, two years, where I have to stop hearing Sonny, and I have to really try to find out 
what do I have to say, you know? And as I transcribe some other people, as I start practicing some different things, as I keep playing gigs and I keep, I mean, that's the really important thing, like you always have to push, you know, like to trying to be better and trying to get your own thing and trying to figure out how can you take that influence into your plane and then mark and then don't bias, you know, and the Gene Amos and then Bad Powell, Lionel Hampton, like all the influence, how that meets together and becomes yourself, you know? And I think that that is through really, really kind of like letting things go, you know, not being afraid to not, like, to not feel the music or not, not feel connected to the ideas, you know? And just keep practicing and, and playing concerts, you know, writing your music, like exploring, letting things go. And that, as time goes by with experience, practicing, you know, good, bad gigs and really like trying to go in a completely different direction, things come together, you know, but it's just a life process, I think. Yes, uh, my friend Gary Bartz, who is past 70, said to me recently, I need another lifetime just to keep working on this music. Uh, talking about your process, you have a new recording out, Visions. Let's, let's look at some video of some of your recent work and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Cut off the ending there. Uh, first of all, uh, I think that was uh, Kush Abade on drums. Who were the other musicians? Pablo Menares uh, on bass and Sam Harris on the piano. And uh, I know, do they both appear on your new recording, Visions? Uh, well, Pablo and Sam uh, Harris were part of the recording, but then um, Kush is a new band member. So I've been very lucky to have him on the band. I absolutely love his playing and, and the guy we've been playing this past year. And I know him from Berkeley, so it was a little bit hard to get him before, but I finally was able to get him on the gigs and I'm very in love with his playing. So the next album is actually with this band, but then we will have Lagalan on the guitar as well. So it will be Quintet. What can you tell us about your newer music and your process about how you got here? Yeah, well, the, the newer music for the album that I'm going to record, you mean? Yes. Uh, well, you know, like there is different sources of inspiration. Like the, the album that they recorded for Vision was basically inspired on Frida Kahlo on her own process of um, finding self-identity through her art. So this next one is like inspired on different themes, you know, like there's one tune um, that is called The Bluest Eye that is inspired in a book that I, I read by Toni Morrison, you know, that talking about concepts of beauty, you know, and, and I wrote a, a, a tune inspired on that. This one is inspired on the political um, um, things that have been happening in Chile this past, this past year. Um, you know, and Los Ojos de Chile means the eyes of Chile, and when the protests were going on there, there is a lot of people that were on the streets, and, and you know, they got um, the, uh, the, their sight, I'm, I'm not sure how to explain this in English, but basically like they lost their sight because of while they were on the protest, you know, so it's a whole organization that is raising money for that, and this is the tune that I wrote inspired on that, you know. And then there is some tunes that got inspired on some, like, paintings, you know, from, there is a painter called uh, Osvaldo Guayasamin from Ecuador, you know, who works a lot with uh, um, a way of painting that is called expressionism, you know, that talks a lot about, like, you know, what is happening politically in Ecuador and talks about, like, the difference uh, with social, you know, like, poor, rich people and what is happening there, you know. So it's a bunch of sources of inspiration. I haven't, I haven't find, like, the main, the main idea, you know, but rather, like, just being inspired by other people's process and how they express themselves through art. Yeah, well, speaking of Chile, we have some viewers online for, uh, from Chile with us today. Uh, a question here from Joaquin Loizia. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Melissa, you've done a lot as an inspiration to Chilean musicians. Tell these gringos about some Chilean music and musicians you listen to or that you recommend. Cheers from Santiago. Yeah, well, you know, I when we talk when I talk about my main influence as a saxophone player, you know, I I'm strongly influenced by the tradition, you know, of this jazz music, you know, which is American and like American and but you know, from Chile I have I have a lot of from South America, actually, there's a lot of musicians I really love, you know. Uh, from Chile, I'm always been in love with, um, uh, you know, the music of Violeta Parra, who is an icon and is a big inspiration for, for all of us, you know. Um, from so There's another musician that is actually from, from Argentina. His name is Espineta, and I grew up listening to his music, and I've been always deeply in love, you know, with the way that he writes and lyrics. Uh, well, the amazing Victor Jara, you know, which is an inspiration for all of us. Um, you know, there's a singer-songwriter called Winga from Brazil that I recently discovered, and he's definitely has been a, an inspiration to me these past years. I mean, this past this past time that I heard him, um, you know, Hermeto Pascual. And, you know, I'm from younger musicians from Chile. Well, there is the amazing Camila Mesa, who is a close friend of mine, and, and she's an inspiration for all of us. Um, you know, there is... Um, Claudia Cunha, who is somebody that like moved to New York uh, before all of us, you know. So she's always been an inspiration for all the younger positions from Chile, you know. Viewer Simon Diaz asks, do you think that as a foreigner you have to move to the U.S. to live the true experience of the music, or is that just a myth? I think that you have to, you know, to be honest. Um, it's just like the, first of all, like, a lot of it is coming from there, you know, like the music that I love, New Orleans and, and the States, you know. So I think that 
coming into the states and 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 understanding the culture too, you know, understanding the history of of this Black American music and where it's coming from is part of the homework too, you know, to understand like why am I here right now? Um, uh, to me, also like, you know, the level is so high. You know, there is so many amazing musicians, and there is so much access to. Well, it used to be so much access, you know, to just. You know, I feel like going to the bunker and listen to this, and then I go to Smalls and listen to that, and then maybe go to Fat Cat and do the hang, and then, you know, Peter Bernstein come, and then Roy Hargrove is playing the jam session, you know. So you're exposed to this very high level of music all the time and, and source of inspiration that I don't think that you can find anywhere else, you know. So at least to me, like being in, in the state for 13 years, it has a lot to do with the way I play, you know. It's just like this contact, constant feeling of like, getting my ass kicked and wanted to become better for myself, you know, and just surrounding myself with the with the highest class of musicians, you know. It, I think it's a very important part of the process and just trying to do your best. And, you know, like one thing that I feel in Chile is that, yeah, you there is good musicians, but like then you get to a level where it's nothing better, you know, and, and that is with all the respect, but it's not just in Chile, it's everywhere, you know, it's just nothing better. So how how do you get inspired? Like how do you get better if you can surround yourself with what is the best? You know. Here's a question from uh, uh, Nelson Rivera: What are your thoughts on seeing more female jazz musicians and female jazz musicians of color becoming more brought to the spotlight? The amount of misogyny that has directed the scene seems to have kept this a boys' club for far too long. I think it's a good thing, you know, um, there is definitely a history of this balance, you know, so I think that's important to acknowledge, uh, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, and it's important to have, I think that like, you know, I'm going to talk as a female musician, I think that it's important to have role models, you know, so there is a thing where, yeah, it's, in, it's good that the people are bringing to the spot like females, but it's not about the gender, just, you know, like it should also be about the music, you know, because if it's not about the music and it's just about like putting all these females that play whatever, then what, as, what about the role model? You know, we need role model. We need like strong females that can play this music and they're serious about it, you know, and it's not about gender. It's just like when they play, it becomes about the music, about who they are as an individual, you know. So I think it's important to remember that balance also for promoters or, you know, for people in general that... It's important to support females, yes, but the music also should be an important part of the element, you know, and we're lucky to have people like, you know, Terline, Chris Davis, um, you know, Linda O, Rini Rosness, and Nat Cohen, you know, a, a lot of musicians, a, a lot of females that are very strong, you know, and I think that that is what the next generation needs, you know, strong role models. Absolutely, we need strong role models. Uh, we kind of burned through an hour here rather quickly. We didn't get to talk about how you won the Thelonious Monk competition and many other things. But uh, someone, uh, Zach Schwartz, actually, from West Palm Beach, Florida, says, Melissa is very articulate in conversation. She is very intelligent, which I knew from her playing. So that's a compliment for you. Uh, let's you. let's uh, look at one more uh, sample of your wonderful tenor sax playing, then we'll come back and close it up. Sounds good. Oops, that's the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, we've uh, kind of come to the end of the road here. Melissa has another engagement to jump off to. But Melissa, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. You're one of the bright thank lights you. in the jazz horizon today. Any thoughts about uh, where you and this music might be heading? I don't know. If, if, if any time of where I've been confusing about everything is right now, <laughs> these past few months, you know. So uh, on my end, I'm just trying to, you know, embrace what is happening, just consciousness about what this world is dealing with, and and just trying to do my best when it comes to music, you know, just trying to get a little bit better every day, trying to see what do I have to do and how can I contribute to to these hard times, you know, through music, through my art. Well, your music is bringing us comfort in these times, and we look forward to seeing what's coming in the future. Thanks everyone Thank from uh, thanks to everyone from Facebook and YouTube who joined us today and participated. Uh, Friday, my guest will be Antonio Hart. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy and keep listening to jazz. <laughs>